We're in 2 Samuel this quarter, and when I saw that, I thought, uh, <laughs> what will I tell these ladies about 2 Samuel? Because a lot of it is just about fighting and things like that. But um, it's difficult for me to just jump right into it, so I thought i got to review 1 Samuel. And then I thought, uh, i got to go back and review Judges a little bit, because Samuel was not only a prophet, he was the judge of Israel, the last judge of Israel. And so we're going to look at that for a minute. The time of the judges took place after the death of Moses and Joshua. There was no one leading the 12 tribes by the word of God as Joshua was commanded to do. In uh, Judges 21, 25, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Israel was in a total mess, falling into the sins and idolatry of the people that they were to have driven out when they went into the land of Canaan. So they had civil wars among themselves. Their enemies surrounded them and caused them to be in service to them when they weren't exterminating them so they were doing that too much like Israel's enemies are still doing today and the ones that are doing it today are the same ones they were supposed to have gotten rid of when they went into the land of Canaan God allowed the Israelites to reap the consequences of their disobedience by letting the pagan nations overtake them and their land and when things really got bad they would cry to the Lord and repent much like we do today when we get away from him and then things start going bad we're like oh Lord help me well the Lord does help us he is so wonderful the Lord would then raise up judges to deliver these people these judges weren't like judges we have today in courtrooms. They were men that God picked and raised up for a specific purpose at specific times, and they didn't succeed one another. They were delivered over and over again from their enemies surrounding them. The Moabites, the Ammonites from Mesopotamia, the Midianites, Philistines, and others, and on and on it went. They would not have had all these enemies to deal with if they had obeyed God. But instead, they mingle with them and intermarried with them. And I thought as I wrote this, well, those stupid people, you know. But then, look at us. Don't we do the same thing? We don't obey God and we get in trouble. A lot of our own problems happen to us because of our own disobedience. So they got in trouble. They cried to God. He sent someone to deliver. But when they, they, things were going good, they did the same thing. They ceased not from their own doings nor from their stubborn ways. They just kept on and on doing the same thing. Romans eleven twenty five through 26 says, Blindness in part has happened to Israel until the time of the Gentiles be come in. <clears throat> and so all Israel shall be saved as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. In the book of Judges, the ones that God raised up picture Jesus, the deliverer, that will come one day. That's what the book of Romans is speaking of. Jesus, the deliverer out of Zion. So when Jesus comes to earth again, Israel is back in their land, just like they were in Judges, and they will be surrounded by heathen nations oppressing them, just like they are in Judges, just like they are today, but at the very end it's really going to be bad in the end of the tribulation they're going to all just surround Jerusalem and be ready to take it and then Jesus the deliverer is coming to set up his kingdom 1 Samuel 7 15 through 17 tells us that Samuel was the last judge of Israel he served as a priest a prophet and a judge and from Moses through Saul, God moved and ruled through the priesthood. But because the priest failed in their duties to God, God set them aside and raised up prophets as his messengers. Then the people decided they wanted a king like all the other nations around them. So God let them have what they wanted and God let them have the kind of king they wanted. God chose Saul and anointed Saul, but Saul was the people's choice. God let them have what they wanted. 
God had said they would have a king as early as the days of Abraham, so wanting a king in itself was not a bad thing, but they wanted a king for the wrong reasons, to fight against their enemies for them. They failed to see that God had been fighting for them all the time. They didn't need a king at that point. When they were in fellowship with God, they won all their battles, but when they were not in fellowship, they got clobbered. God tells Samuel to give the people what they want. He tells Samuel, they've not rejected you, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. So in the book of Samuel, the government of Israel changes from what is called a theocracy, which is a priest ruling in the name of God, to a kingdom with prophets speaking in the name of the Lord instead. One of the main things to be learned from 1 Samuel is that God's work must be done in God's way. The main three characters in 1 Samuel were Samuel, Saul, and David. And the main character from start to finish in 2 Samuel is David. So God gave the people the king they wanted. But David was the first real king of Israel, the one truly chosen by God. The nation of Israel was slow in its development until David's kingdom was established. And this kingdom is the message of both the Old and the New Testament. The first book of the New Testament gives the long genealogy of Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, showing that he is from the line of David and is the promised Messiah who has the right to rule the throne of David. The first message of the New Testament was given by John the Baptist, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So a kingdom with the king ruling is God's ultimate plan and he plans to put King Jesus on the throne. Jesus is from the line of King David and in the book of Samuel, the coming millennial kingdom is foreshadowed. In the books of Samuel, we see in the reign of King David at least three things that is needed for a kingdom to be successful. A powerful king who uses that power to rule righteously. A king who will rule with total dependence on God the Father. And a king who will rule in total obedience to God the Father. In King Jesus, all of these requirements will be completely fulfilled, but we get a glimpse of it in David's reign. So watch for pictures of the second coming and the kingdom that's going to come as you study the entire Bible, but 2 Samuel is about the setting up of the throne of David from which Christ will one day rule. In Isaiah 9, it talks about it for unto us, a child is born, and to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And it tells us that um, of this government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. He shall be great. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign forever and ever. Won't that be a wonderful time? In 2 Samuel, we see the very beginnings of that kingdom that's one day going to be on this earth. Okay, you can uh, look at 2 Samuel chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. After the death of Saul, David returned from defeating the Amalekites and stayed in Ziglag two days. On the third day, a man arrived from Saul's camp with his clothes torn, with dust on his head. When he came to David, he fell to the ground to pay him honor. Where have you come from, David asked him. He answered, I have escaped from the Israelite camp. What happened, David asked, tell me. He said, the men fled from the battle. Many of them fell and died, and Saul and his son, Jonathan, are dead. Then David said to the young man who brought him the report, How do you know that Saul and his son Jonathan are dead? Now in movies, when it involves a hero and a villain, most often we see at the end of the story, the villain dies and the hero wins. Star Wars, Robin Hood, Blue Bloods, (laughs) everything. 
I think they get that from the Bible. I think they looked at the Bible and, and copied some of these things. Um, through most of 1 Samuel, we saw our hero David being persecuted by Saul. But 2 Samuel opens up with good winning over evil. But it's all in God's time and in God's way, not ours. Sometimes we think it will never come, but it does come and it will come. And that's where we have to practice patience and exercise our faith and just trusting in God. David could have killed Saul many times. In 1 Samuel, he came so close and could have easily ended it all. But he knew that God was in control and that God would deal with the matter when God got ready to. This is one thing we can take away from the book of Samuel is to look at David's life in that he just waited on God. My big problem, my besetting sin, I think, would be worry fretting over stuff that I can do nothing about, and I think I have a lot of company <laughs> in that. Um, I find it difficult just to wait on God to show me the answer to do something. A lot of times I'll pray, Lord, what can I do? What can I say in this situation to make things better, you know? And then instead of waiting on Him to show me, or maybe there's nothing I can say, but instead of praying, giving it to God, and going on about my business, I just keep worrying. I need to pray and release, pray and release, and believe that God can handle the situation for me, and He can. And also, if He wants me to do something, He will show me. So I'm practicing that these days, just waiting, <laughs> just zipping my mouth and waiting until I know God wants me to say this or do this. So we can learn that from David's life. Saul was the king of Israel. He was put in that place by God, but Saul fell, so God chose David to replace him as king. Saul had sons, but God said the rain would be removed from Saul and from his family. So imagine how that revelation must have been for David, because his very best friend in the whole wide world was Saul's son, who would have been heir to that throne. You know, he was taking Jonathan's place. But it does not seem like David spent his time worrying about it. He trusted in God to work it out. At the end of 1 Samuel, in order to hide out from Saul, David has been living with the Philistines. Now, in reviewing, I said, wait a minute, <laughs> with the Philistines? Well, Saul and his men were after him, so David made friends with Achish. He was king of Gath and one of the lords of the Philistines. Goliath was the Philistine, the giant that David killed. The Philistines had been the enemy all David's life, and here David is living with them. How? <laughs> well, a verse came to my mind, Proverbs 16, 7. Keep in mind, David had no other place to go. And Proverbs 16, 7 says, When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. So David had found refuge in enemy land. And we find that these Philistines were about to go out and fight Saul's army. And David was planning on going right along with them. I'm sure it was an awkward spot for David, but these people David had lived with, they had protected him, so he intended to go and attack his own people with them. But God intervened. See there? God works things out. The leaders of the Philistines came and talked to Achish about it. They didn't want David to go with them in fear that he might be reconciled with his people and turn on them. This was God working Romans 8, 28 in David's life. We don't always realize how many times God graciously intervenes in our lives, but he does, whether we know it or not. If David had helped win the battle against Saul, he never would have become king of Israel, and Saul's son Ishbosheth would have been king instead. Proverbs 16, 9 says, A man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. God gives us choices. 
sometimes we get in a storm of trouble because of our own choices and God allows it sometimes for a purpose David didn't make this storm with Saul but God allowed him to be put in it but it's comforting to me to know that in the life of a Christian God is always at work on our behalf he's always in control and whether we put ourselves in the storm or whether he allows us to be put there he is the one that directs our steps and he's right there with us look at first samuel chapter 29 verses 8 and 9 <clears throat> yeah first <laughs> Achish has just told David that he can't go with them because it would displease the lords of the Philistines. And David said unto Achish, But what have I done? And what hast thou found in thy servants so long as I've been with thee unto this day that I may, know, may not go and fight against the enemies of my lord the king? David does not realize it, but God is directing this scene in his life. And Achish answered and said to David, I know that thou art good in my sight as an angel of God. Notwithstanding the princes of the Philistines have said, he shall not go up with us to this battle. Thou art good in my sight as an angel of the Lord. People are drawn to righteous people. It may not seem like it in all cases, but I believe they are. In some way, they're drawn to the righteous because there's a glimpse of Jesus in the righteous people. So whether they would admit it or not, they're listening to what we say. They're watching for what we do. And I really believe the world is dying to see a real Christian. They want to know there's a life beyond this and that there's a, a heaven and an Eden and they're going to see their loved ones again. I believe they really are dying to see a real Christian. So I believe they're drawn to us. When you read about the life of David and how he conducted himself with his men and with strangers and with God, you can see why these people were drawn to him. When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. If you haven't read 1 Samuel chapter 30, go back and read it and see how he responded to people in just that one chapter. He was a loyal friend, he was good and kind, but at the same time he was no wimp. Nobody could accuse David of that. In, in uh, chapters 29 and 30, God worked Romans 8.28 in several ways for David. <clears throat> in 2 Samuel 1, an Amalekite comes into David's camp with news of how the battle went with the Philistines and Saul's army. I think he lies. I noticed in our study book, they think he was telling the truth. But uh, he says he, let me see, where is that? 2 Samuel he says that, um, oh, where was that? There's a discrepancy in the way he puts it about Saul's death. Let's see. Let me find it again. He comes and he tells David what he thinks David wants to hear. He tells him that Saul and his sons are dead. Then in order to gain favor with David, he tells them that he is the one that did it and he has Saul's crown and bracelet to prove it. But this backfired on him. He didn't do it, I don't believe. He just came along afterwards and took the crown and bracelet and then took credit for the death of Saul. In 1 Samuel 31, 3 through 5, it tells the story. And the story is that Saul couldn't get his armor bearer to finish him off after being mortally wounded. So he intentionally falls on his own sword and dies. But this man tells David that he killed the king thinking he's going to get a reward or something. He gets something, but it's not a reward. <laughs> but if you look back over there in verse, um, 1 Samuel 31... He doesn't even tell it right. Saul took a sword and fell upon it. And then he tells David, Saul leaned upon his spear. And 
that it wounded him and that he came along and finished him off. So it clearly to me tells you in in 1 Samuel 31 it says let's see let's look back at that Saul said unto his armor bearer draw thy sword and thrust me through therewith lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and abuse me but his armor bearer would not for he was afraid therefore Saul took a sword and fell upon it and when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead he fell likewise upon his sword and died with him. So the guy, the Amalekite came and told David, I finished him off. But over here it says he was dead, so I think he was dead. Anyway, like Brother Matt says, put yourself in that Amalekite's place for a minute. Can you imagine, you're expecting David to be joyful um, that you killed his enemy for him. You expect his army of men to be whooping and dancing and shouting for joy. There's a, let's have a party. Let's praise this guy because he killed Saul. He killed my enemies. Instead, what you get is David and his men standing before him hearing the news. And David took hold of his clothes and rent them. And his men did the same thing, and they mourned and wept for Saul and for Jonathan his son and for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel because they were fallen by the sword. The tearing of one's clothes in the, is an ancient Jewish tradition that expresses great, overwhelming sense of grief and mourning and loss. I wonder if David fell down on his knees as he tore his clothes, or did he just look around at his men as he ripped them and his men did the same thing? I wonder how that Amalekite felt as he watched this happening. They started mourning and weeping. I wonder if he thought, uh-oh. <laughs> and he looked around him and there was no place to run. He was surrounded. David said, How wast thou not afraid to stretch forth thine hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? Then the Amalekite knows he's in trouble. And David called one of his young men to kill the Amalekite, and he smote him. And David said, Thy blood be upon thy head, for thy mouth has testified against thee, saying, I have slain the Lord's anointed. The Amalekite apparently thought he would have responded to this news and compared himself to what he thought David would feel. So the Bible tells us it's not a wise thing to do to compare ourselves with other people, which must be what this Amalekite thought. Well, if my enemy was slain, I would reward the one that did it. David was called a man after God's own heart, and his reaction to situations would be nothing like the natural man's reactions would be. The Christian walking in the Spirit does not react as the world reacts. David did not rejoice. He wept, not only for his people Israel, for his friend Jonathan, but also for his enemy Saul. He was a man after God's own heart. And we're told in Proverbs 24, 17, Rejoice not when thine enemy faileth, and let not thy heart be glad when he stumbleth. There are times in the Psalms when we see David rejoices over his enemies, but it's not that they fail, it's rather that the glory of God was manifested in the situation. When Trump got elected, I think the glory of God was manifested in that situation. He took what the media and everyone thought was just a little handful of nobodies and he put a man in office that would bring Christ back into Christmas prayer back into the White House and Jerusalem back as the capital of Israel. Just look. Ah, God has been manifested. Was, is it yesterday or today that he met with the yeah. today? Or tomorrow. He has 20 hours to... Uh, I just know that because the chief news was... Okay, what, what, what? <laughs> he landed today. He did, yeah. yeah. He's in Singapore, going to meet with uh, little Kim. Uh, to okay. Try to work out a deal. Okay. okay. I wonder if they're going to tell about that, which is a blessing because. Oh yeah. yeah. He's, he's a 
I know. Which is scary. I think the Lord's just given given us one more chance, you know, because we know it won't last because of what the Bible says, but there could be revival, you know, before the end. Even God works through Trump who can't keep his mouth shut. <laughs> like, so, it just makes me want to choke him. Like, would you sh- just shut up? Well, Joseph in the just, Bible was the same way. He went and told his brothers, look what daddy made for me, you know. He got in trouble for it, too. I'm just, I'm wanting the Lord to get on him and make him be, have some discernment about what he says or whatever. No, if he were like that, then he might not accomplish it. Exactly. Here's him. Yeah. And he needs some shimmer lights in that hair, too. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that's a. That's you know, good. Spray tan in it and making it orange or something. <laughs> I know. I, I know with you, a beautician, you really. I know. <laughs> you can't have brassy hair. Like, oh, goodness. But he might be a redhead or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we rejoiced in the election of Trump. I think everybody here rejoiced in it. I know I did. <laughs> and, uh, because God's awesomeness was seen in that. But at the same time, we should pray for those who don't rejoice in it. We've seen by the way David was treated by Saul and how he responded by not killing him when he easily could have. We see that David was sincere in his grief and it moved all those around him to respond the same. I think partly because they loved David so much could be the reason they wept with him, living, um, living there with him and loving him. An advantage is sometimes gained by the fall of the enemy, but someone that's really living close to the Lord would never take joy in it. After his time of mourning and fasting, David wrote down some beautiful feelings of sorrow as a tribute to those who were slain. And I think we're going to stop there today and we will uh, start there next Sunday and finish up with chapter 1 and we will go into chapter 2 also.